Kind of, this is the first talk we've done, so I don't know if it will be a complete train wreck, but kind of, uh, hopefully we'll have more talks in the future, uh, depending on how this goes. But we have the artist, so uh, so far we're successful. Uh, there are some people here, so it's also a success. But yeah, uh, James, it's really nice. Uh, type, it's really nice that we've got to show your work. Um, James is uh, quite an amazing artist, and over the past few months, I've been interviewing him and getting to know about your practice. And uh, it's a pleasure to have him here. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you. By the way, I'm I'm very deaf, so. If I don't answer the question, I mean, you by all means ask questions. I've done this, but um, please try and speak um, as you would to someone with hard of hearing. Um, I'm going to be about sort of 40 minutes or 30 minutes, depending how it goes. Um, this is called Painting Along the Digital River, which dig Painting the Digital River was a book I wrote some 12 years ago in America, and uh, about a painter using digital technology myself fact. Um, so what I'm doing, I'm going to, these are sort of rather arbitrary sections, but um, I'm going to talk about my beginnings and how are the process, but it's mostly a bit, a bit how I make pictures. Can, can you put the next? Set? Thank you. Um, I actually started painting pretty young um, at primary school um, because <coughs> of what a rather odd reason, and I, I sort of actually started oil paint when I was about nine years old. Um, I, my older brother, was a year older, won an um, art prize, in fact, although he became a successful banker later, um, and I copied every picture out of Oliver Warner's British Marine painting. When I was, so those were my beginnings. Can you put the next slide on, please? Thanks. So when I was... Um, I, I was advised when I was at St. Martin's that I should take up being a forger because I had um, some sort of technical skill, but very few, very little, few, I was lacking in ideas, I think. But I was, had a, I was very fortunate to be at St. Martin's, and then I was at the Royal College, and I think I did this when I stood at the Royal College, although I didn't work there at all, really. Um, but I was very fortunate in the people who taught me from, I did sculpture at St. Martin's briefly and was with um, people like Anthony Caro and I was actually studied with Leon Kossoff, the very expressionist thick paint and there was the beginnings of um, conceptual art with people like Gilbert and George and I actually worked for an artist, Sol Lewitt, doing his wall drawings at that period as a, as a student. Good, next. And then by um, 1972 I was in, in New York and I was overwhelmed by, by the kind of paintings and work I saw there and interviewed Robert Morris, who was um, there. So very briefly, can I, next slide, I just want to show that how it, one thing led to another. And um, with, us, with some others, I started a magazine called Art Scribe in 1976. And it was because the mainstream, the main magazines like Student International were not covering painting. It was a, um, there was a view then, and this happens recurring, that painting was at an end and we should be doing what, f photographic or conceptual or performance or some other kind of art. So after, uh, um, after about a year, we started with 70 pounds, this magazine, and then um, by the fourth or fifth issue, the others doing it sort of dropped away because we had to put our own money to it. So I continued editing and this would be the 10th issue. And it became a, the main UK, or well, one of the leading magazines in, in England, and we exported a lot to America. And you can see here, they, they, we had to have quite a broad remit. It wasn't simply just about painting. We got um, performance art and all sorts of things. Uh, but it became quite sort of successful, not financially successful. But um, the point is, I was doing painting and this at the same time, which was very hard, but it gave me a certain um, prominence and next, uh, and uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, but my own work had been evolving from uh, lots of things were in the air about sort of minimal art and um, what's going to happen to painting. Next slide, too. But then in about 1978, I sort of made a big change. Um, and 
myself and several others, and the, these would include um, a good friend, Gary Ragg, and Bruce Russell, and Bill Henderson, and we sort of, I was asked to select part of the show of, at the Hayward Gallery called the Hayward Annual, and this is a painting I did for that. It's hard to explain now why this was significant. First of all, the Hayward Gallery and the Hayward Annual was a much more prominent exhibition. It was, it had started as, because artists had protested in 1977, they weren't represented. And so it, it was a very politically balanced show. So you had, when, the, when I was in Hayward Annual, you had it, there was a figurative section, the abstract section, there was a conceptual section and, and so on. Um, but this was a painting that's 16 feet wide. I called it Lazy Afternoons because that was the exact opposite of the kind of mindset with which I did it. I was very neurotic. But this was shown in a, about 12 years ago in an, um, an exhibition about artists who were prominent in 1979. And so you get, um, by this time, through the magazine, I was very much part of a milieu of, with older artists like Bert Irvin, you see on the left there, um, it's Nick Pope and Garth Evans here. Uh, and next slide, please. And one, one thing that in this um, earlier stages of my life doing painting, um, it got me to Australia. It got me to America and France and all sorts of places, but it mainly got me to Australia in 1983 on a lecture tour. I was an artist in residence as well in Melbourne. And um, my ambition was to get to the Great Barrier Reef which I did, and I went to Heron Island, which is where David Attenborough filmed the first, the turtles in the first Life on Earth series. And boy, was it fantastic being underwater there. Um, this is a 10 foot wide painting, which was done after being there. Um, and it was also uh, a kind of um, proving to myself something, because I decided to stop doing criticism and editing, and I was, I sort of resigned from editing Artscribe after sort of eight years, really and cast myself off to just doing painting. It was not a great idea financially because I couldn't get a teaching job very easily. I eventually got a job in Preston teaching half a day art history. But um, this, the one thing about this painting of 1980, would have been 84, was that <clears throat> underwater, there's, you, some of you must know this, that some of the fish you see are actually phosphorescent. So there's this thing called the surgeon fish, which has got... Um, so they're all so beautiful, and uh, how can I put it? Well, some people say, put your head under there and you forgive up painting. But it, it is, I saw manta rays, sharks, the whole lot. And the other difficult point about sort of doing a picture is most of them are hardly visible because they're camouflaged against the coral. Anyway, this, this was a sort of, without realizing at the time, it was my lead into a kind of more electronic kind of art. Next slide. And the first... Um, computers I used were, apart from the BBC micros, were um, the pre-runners of Macintosh called Apple II. There was no hard disk or anything like that. And this is one of the first um, programs you could use called Dazzle Draw. And you can see the resolution there is pretty crude. And bear in mind the screen would have been about this big and you couldn't hardly print anything from it. And um, next. And then a few years, a year or two later, I'd, I bought my own equipment. Um, an Amiga and, and a very expensive printer called a Xerox 4020, um, the first kind of inkjet printers. And these were, these were seriously expensive. I mean, a printer then, which um, would cost you about £1,200, and it would be now un completely unacceptable in terms of quality. Uh, and you only had, um, I think, eight or 16 colours. But what I did here um, was to um, cheat the system because without... Without any hard disk or with very little memory, you could only sort of, <clears throat> the, the only what, what they called output would be like on the equivalent of toilet paper, about that big. So, so what I did was, in, it's hard to explain, I, I made a composition that you could never see because it would have nine bits to it. But so you had to know, you do this one section and another section, and you had to do a diagram at how it would fix together. And I also put, the printing paper over each other, so you would get extra colours through transparency. But I had a, a, a wonderful time, and this is another one. Um, the I knew that um, what you could do with these. By then, I was using programs called things like um, 
uh, deluxe paint. It was fantastic. I knew it was very limited, but I just, I, I'd always done a lot of watercolors and gouache, and now I could do it at such speed and with such um, maneuverability. It, it was fantastic. I, there were lots of things that were probably wrong, because one thing I was concerned with was, was to prove you could do larger work. So all these are about a meter across. Next one, please. And the other thing was that it was rather like um, taking drugs, which you shouldn't do, but um, it, your, your, your sort of world is turns upside down, and what was certain before is no longer certain. And my, I was doing a lot of large paintings, 10 feet, and it probably set me back in some ways because you could be so much less inhibited working digitally than you could when you're working with real paint. And because one simple reason is that every large painting costs quite a bit of money in terms of materials. And um, I couldn't sort of do 20, 10 foot pictures in a, in a morning, but I could digitally next. Um, and then I acquired um, a digital camera. That this, you may or may not know that digital cameras were really not available until the early 90s. And the first one I got was one actually Apple produced, which could only take eight or 16 shots at a time. Um, can you go back one, please? Thanks. Uh, and this was a picture I did. We're using uh, what was called a quick take camera. It's, if this is, again, it's about a meter across. And using photographs within a paint program was a, a new thing, for me at least. And what I decided to do was to go to Leicester Square and photograph people um, who were carrying maps or who were lost or who were... I went there repeatedly, and I sort of made a kind of amateur analysis of the kind of people you see there, who, who were Italians, who were Scandinavians, Italians do this, you know, etc. And there were certain types of behaviour that were quite interesting, because before mobile phones, if you were on a blind date, the best place to meet was by a phone box, because it looked like you were waiting for a phone call. So if you were stood up, you didn't look conspicuous. And I mean, you learned things like this. And, and the conversations you overheard, but it was, a, it was a sort of odd thing. But the odd thing was, by now I had the sort of first... Um, web available programs like Mosaic were there and so I was on the internet and someone saw this and um, got in touch and they were from the um, the BBC next and so through this I got a, involved in a project in 97 um, working for the new premises for the BBC news it never came to anything because there was someone called Chris Evans not the Chris Evans, someone else who was in charge and there's also um, what was called um, Bert, who was the accountant in charge, and the whole thing was scrapped. But I had a fantastic insight into how the news is done, and I even wrote one word of the news, which is another story, but can you next one? But the effect was I'd, I had this sort of sense that the, the news desk, which was, was like an altar, and it was the, each sort of what was then the 9 o'clock news was like a religious ceremony going out to millions of people and... Um, I wondered what Turner would have made of it because it was like sort of in a plane over a city at night and you s have this sense of being in contact with so many things and yet a story is condensed to 30, 30 seconds. It w so I did some pictures which were technically quite difficult um, but which were sort of a bit like this uh, with that sort of idea. In fact, there's a, there's a self-portrait of myself in, in here, slightly exaggerated, and also I was took part in, a, in a, quite independently a, a BBC program about um, self-made studios. Um, <coughs> and so they, they, there are two people, she's um, Janet Lee's in the red shirt, and there's Bernie, who were filming me with some, some of the first digital cameras. That was about 95. Next, please. Thank you. And the, the technical devices, I mean, so what happens sometimes is uh, you... You can have an idea you work on and you think about that, but then you find a technical way to do it. But then you get involved, then you realize, oh, I've got, the, I've got something I can do here technically, which could be, I can forget about the ideas and just do it with that kind of depth and overlap. These sort of devices are now very common in programs like Photoshop, but this was before they were <coughs> as readily available, drop shadows. I had to do all, all that independently. Thank you, this is fine. And, and so, the paintings I was doing were, um, we, I was sort of re-entering the kind of cliches of the School of Paris. Um, I, I was kind of lost, but it was a good feeling. And I, uh, this was a painting, um, 
again, it's slightly smaller than that, but the, the figure is, was taken from a Turkish barber's reversed, you know, in negative. Next, please. And I was also drawing a lot, which I'll come to later. Um, and the, I'm sure you know this, but in, in, when you work um, drawing digitally, you can do things like customize the brush. So the, you can be quite inventive with, with line, um, do things you can't do with a colored pencil, for example. So this is an Italian. When I say digital, all of these works are physical. They're all printed, the ones I, I sort of sh are showing. They, 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 nothing is sort of simply virtual. It all has a physical presence. Next, please. And this is another eight-foot picture. And like I said, with a digital camera, the odd thing was you could... Um, it was quite unlike a physical camera <coughs> where you had to buy the film and you would wait to get it developed. With a digital camera, you could see something... <coughs> In this case, a swan in Camden Town, of all places. And um, with the same day, you could put it into a... Well, start putting it in a painting. The, the swan is entirely... Um, it, it's all oil paint here, and the swan is. So the one thing, with, of course, with a digital image, you can analyse the colour in minute detail. And the weird thing about the swan in the canal is one of the colours that's in that painting is orange, not a colour you'd expect to associate with water. The other sort of um, point about this was that th there was a not particularly intended irony because the, if you like, the more abstract forms are much more watery than the literal photographic one. Next, please. So the, these, this world I was in, um, I'd written some, I'd been... I had written criticism in the past and writing, and, and I'd had a lot of experience by now of conferences and um, clashes about using computers in painting, and been a lot in America and Germany. And one thing, I managed to um, persuade a publisher in, New, in America to, that I have a shot at a book, which um, was published in 2006 by Apprentice Hall, which is part of the Pearson Group. It's what the only book published that were then, that was both in the art section and the computing section, which was quite pro in the computer graphics section. Um, I won't talk too much about it, but the next slide, it's probably the only book on this category, computer graphics and art, that has watercolours at the beginning of each chapter. And my editor, who is in, in Boston, um, I just said, look, I've, I've been going to the studio every day, every day this while I've, the six months I've been doing the final edit, and I just do paint pictures so I forget about this wretched book. But then I found that the pictures I was doing were horribly appropriate for the titles I was using. So um, he said, oh, well, why not? Next slide. So the, this sort of rather frustrated um, sort of watercolour that, that I was doing were um, at the front of each chapter. I want to come back to watercolours later. Next slide, please. Now, I want to fast forward to a different theme entirely, which is that I don't actually like being having um, too clear an idea what I'm doing or being having to account for it. And luckily, if you don't, unlike if you're a student where you do all have to answer for your work, if you're just working on your own, you don't have to. So I've always thought, I had to get a talk, I, a couple of years back, and I thought, well, in case someone has, says, where do you get your ideas or what it's about, I just say, it's from the sky. Next, please. I'm a member of the RSPB, the Royal Society of Protection of Birds, and spend a lot of time at Minsmere in Suffolk. And um, then I would sort of... It's just that the way different birds fly and exist and what they do is just infinitely interesting. And I'm a particularly keen on on, on lapwings, which fly in a very distinct way. So this is a, the, the sort of initial, one of the initial photographs I took. Next one, please. And this is sort of going in on it with a, putting a blue background. And the next. Now, before Christmas it was about, for, the, I saw there was a project available to produce um, a very high in the Olympic Park. My studio is right next to the Olympic Park. The, the, there's a new building and they were a huge 100-foot hall, 100 foot high hall, and they, you, there was a kind of competition to produce pictures for this essentially. So I knocked this up. This is, this is one case where this, is, this does not exist, that's sort of mocked up, and sort of put it forward. 
but I didn't get anywhere with it. But I thought, well, there's something interesting about this. So I played around with these um, f shapes and birds for a bit. And next one, please. Lovely. And um, so you see here that I was already doing, I always do a lot of drawing digital without any purpose. And so these, the, the lap wings were fitting into this pattern. And then I, um, I worked on it a bit. And then I made a huge mistake. Um, next one, please. Which was this picture, which is next door. It was, uh, I went, it was um, what, it, what I did was repeated it accidentally. But I thought, well, that'll work all right. And at the same time, this was, Use, I wanted, it was a commission for um, the London group where I was producing lots of tickets for an auction. So this had to be sliced up into 64 different bits with different numbers on the back. So that's a, it's a, you know, one reason I wrote the book about called Painting the Digital River was that I was, there were so many misunderstandings of what you can do with computers and art that I wanted to put, and I was confused myself, but I wanted to put on record um, that there were things like accidents involved and it wasn't always impersonal, you could use nature or whatever, but anyway, next slide. Um, and this is a painting of 10 years ago where I was, we can clearly see the, um, I was combining the underpainting, which is free painting, and the overpainting, which is taken straight from a projected digital image. There was a kind of saxophone shape on the left which gave me a lot of bother. Next slide please. You can see there that was actually shown at the Hilton Hotel Trafalgar Square um, in 2007. Gives you sense. Uh, next slide please. And this was similarly this was um, inspired by the Olympics being I had parking permission to be right next to the Olympics so I could walk straight in when I had a ticket for that, the diving, that was f five years ago, and um, I was, there was a tremendous feeling of optimism in the, the Olympic Park at the time, and um, this was sort of inspired by that, and, a, and by a tablecloth, to be honest. This is about that size. Next slide, please. Um, uh, yes, and it was about, I could describe myself as a sports artist, because in, um, 2009, I got a message from, and I thought, this has to be spam from, from Africa. You know, it says you've been selected and can you blah, blah, blah. But I re did reply, and um, it wasn't spam at all. I'd been, I would been asked to do, you say, a print for the World Cup 2010 in South Africa, representing the, the British team, along English team, along with four other artists. And so there were a weird contracts from FIFA about you couldn't have any footballer's profile because they're all sort of, um, you, you know, they're all, you have to pay for that. So I did a kind of abstracted version of footballers. I did a lot of drawing and things. Um, but I'd, I did it in the summer. Next slide, please. And one, I'd, um, I remembered the, I'd photographed these um, Soviet textiles in Boston from the 50s. And so I sort of cheated. I used some of the motifs and ideas from this. Next one, please. And this is sort of close up. If you know anything about um, software, this is all done in Illustrator, which is a um, different kind of program, really, to what I usually use. I got away, well, I wasn't supposed to, I got away by putting Brazil in the middle, but um, if you know the colors. Next slide, please. So again, because I was doing, uh, I had to, that was a fascinating project to do, which I made nothing out of. I mean, the place, the company that set it up went bust, but it was, I was next to North Korea in the um, lineup of, of artists, which was quite interesting. And my picture was, among, was right behind Seth Blatter, the now disgraced Seth Blatter, when it was, um, they announced it in uh, Cape Town. But it, it had the effect of some of the shapes and forms would spill over into paintings like this. Next. Um, I don't want you to get the idea that I'm that romantic. I did a colour test on the internet the other day, a stupid thing just to waste time on Facebook, and um, about your colour sense, not your perception, but what colours you liked. I came out as 90% female, which I was very pleased about. But, um, uh, but I mean, it's just, it, I, I, but some of the, the things that could lead to pictures are not necessarily particularly 
of that ilk. This plug, you can see, is the background to this picture. And the other thing I said from the sky, and I gave myself the project of um, whatever would appear in the sky when I was in Suffolk, um, I wanted to photograph a particular kind of Harrier, but what appeared instead was an Apache helicopter. So I, that, that went in the picture. So that's a kind of antidote to a lyrical kind of romantic approach. Um, this is a, a more recent picture about a year or so ago that um, is a bit of a mess, but I, I'm also a great, um, I get very excited by the night sky and you have a good telescope, so I just call this night sky. It's a large ape, it's about that size. Now, I want to go on to <clears throat> more about the process. Um, and I, one of the things you can do on, next slide please, on um, what I've learned to do is, um, I wouldn't call it collage, because it's not. With collage, you're using found material. In this kind of, this is a, again a, a physical work of about two meters across. Um, I found myself making very temporary sculptures out of cardboard, like in the bottom here, which would only be up on the wall for maybe 10 minutes. But I'd photograph them and integrate them into this design. So the, what, the way it works is I would, be photographing things in my studio at the time, lots of drawing done on the floor in paint, um, and then reassembling them digitally. This was also done that way. Um, it started with a lot of drawing in the V&A Museum and um, of some Czech plates of all things. And then all the color changed and I ended up like this. So my point is there's a process underneath all this which is to do with assemblage, um, if you keep on this one. But more recently, in the last year or two, I've, um, I've been doing this a different way. I maybe get the reverse. I do a lot of drawings and um, very poor watercolours and things. So I use the reverse side of them and I stick them up on the wall and I do very fast um, paintings. I do another lot on the floor. And then I cut them up physically. I mean, that's the deal, that whatever you do is going to be cut up and thrown away. And I reassemble the next one into... Um, can you get the next slide on? Um, I put them, I, I both cut them up physically, first of all, and then I, here we go, and then I cut them up digitally as, as well. So I get this um, slightly cubist feel of, I suppose what I think it is all about is that I don't think I'm, for myself, I can compose very well. But if I make it um, accidental or use um, gimmicks of some sort, I can get a better result. So this is, these, what I'm now doing is, these will be a series of um, pictures like, this is another one, this is from a blue source. Uh, um, of This is large drawings in blue that I cut up. I call these ones portraits of blue. And so these both use the same source. And there are little bits and pieces that are actually digitally drawn, but on the whole it's using the kind of um, qualities of watercolor essentially. Because you can't assemble what the trouble with watercolor is you can't have dramatic contrasts very easily in it. You can't have sharp edges, but you can if you do it this way. Right, I want to come on to watercolor because that's something I've always done. Um, next one, please. Um, this goes back to when I was in Australia. I stopped in Thailand on the way in 1983 and borrowed some pens in the Bangkok Museum and did a lot of things and I, um, I love the way they can use gold inlay in, in dark things and so this is actually what, more than 30 years old but um, can you, there's missed one there, that's one but in the last few years I do, uh, I do at least one large watercolour every day and most of them are disastrous but occasionally I get ones I can hang on to and I, I won a prize for the Royal Watercolour Society five years ago and um, been quite involved. I'm now actually at the treasurer of the Royal Watercolour Society, which is a very old, an odd organization, but it's, it's quite odd being part of that as well as being a digital, in the digital world, in the painting world. They're sort of, they don't always overlap. Um, they sort of, uh, my colleagues at the Royal Watercolour Society will often say things like, um, I don't normally like abstract art, but 
Yes, but I feel very guilty because I spend so little time on watercolours. I mean, I do a lot, but I seldom spend more than five minutes on them. And they're, all, they're mostly not done by, by me, but by the paint. But I've learnt a few things. Um, <clears throat> we can stick on this one. Can you go back one? There's uh, one of the things, um, there's an elderly member, I know I'm elderly, but even older, um, who I asked, um, I was asking about his technique, and, he's, and he said yes, whether he worked them vertically or horizontally. He said, I work them vertically. And he's a very figurative artist, and he said, um, there are two ways of doing watercolour. You can either do them very, very slowly or very fast. And so I said, I'll do mine, you know, I mean, mine very fast. But I also often, I do, a lot of these were done on the wall and then on the floor afterwards, rather than at a slope. Next one, please. This is just a couple of weeks ago. I was actually, um, I've sometimes in my weird career, I've, I've um, reviewed software for a, for a computer graphics magazine, a high-end one selling very expensive stuff. But I was also recently um, doing a um, research for, I mean, I was testing some new paints, watercolour paints, which is a very odd thing to do, you know, because um, most watercolours manufacturers, it's made for the amateur market. And the trouble is I don't use watercolour with much purpose in mind. I just see what it does. And I, I like to say to myself, I can use very cheap materials. It doesn't matter if it's... But if you use some really good quality stuff, my boy, can you get results. But the differences are so subtle that, he, I mean, I don't think you'd ever learn to do it. But I, I counted, I'm using something like 60 different colours here, but I don't do it with anything, any kind of sensible process. I just... Take them at random. Next one, please. And this is a picture that's actually on show in London in the autumn watercolour show at the moment. This is actually combining um, both on the floor and vertically, but also I used um, uh, shapes I'd found in my big drawn collage cutabout things too. So a lot of these elements are actually put in from being projected, so they would be... Um, sort of at random with what else was going on. You may think that this, can you go back a moment, that the, the splashiness of these is to do with being expressive or something. It's nothing to do with that. It's, it's much more to do with it. If you actually drop paint from a certain height, um, the pattern it makes is, has a logic to it that you can't do if you just try to, if you try and ever, it's like birds, if you try and do a drawing of seagulls, you could never do it because the way the seagulls or different species of birds group, especially things like um, jackdaws, where they pair off in the spring, is very distinct. There's, it's not random at all. It's all, everything, every movement has a purpose. Um, and so the, I really don't know what I'm doing here, but what I do know is it's nothing to do with being expressive. Um, next one, please. That's just the last sort of watercolour I chose. And, um, so a lot of the work in this kind of watercolour is actually deciding which one you keep. It's not in having... I suppose there's a lot of to do with the touch and the feel of the brush and that sort of stuff, but it's, um, it's taking away your control or part of the control that gets in the way. So it, it, I think I learnt a lot about watercolour from using digital things. Finally, the last section is just about sources. Next one, please. I do... This is... Um, again, I apologise. This, this is taken from the internet for a rare thing. This is um, uh, from the Chapman Drawing Book of 1863. It, I've to collect how to draw books. I've got a massive collection of about 150 now, from about 1880 to 1950. I don't know why I do it, but I've done it... I've started as a student actually doing it, and... Um, uh, they, I love the images, and I love the kind of contentious prose you get with them. Um, and in this case, I was just arranging these, and I thought, well, that's an interesting arrangement, and I'm stuck with this larger 10-foot painting. Next one. So why don't I just put that in? So in the background here, you'll see I've just simply copied that. It was alphabetical, so you get um, sort of sheep, oh, you know, sheep are next to yachts is one thing, ears and feet. It was shown at a exhibition commemorating about space studios, where I, I think I'm the longest running space tenant, space studio since 1971, but um, it was shown upside down. And I went up to the um, 
attendant, and I said, um, I think that painting's upside down. He said, oh, no, 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 the curator knew what they were doing. I said, yes, but look, there's a foot in the middle and some faces. No, 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 I think it's supposed to be. He's an abstract painter. I said, well, I, I did it, and I do know that. It's supposed to be the other way around. Oh. So they actually did turn it around in the middle of this rather gala sort of private view. But um, I was a bit sort of upset because you get sort of stereotyped. And how many people actually look at pictures? Couldn't you see it was upside down? Uh, next, please. Um, so what I had been doing for quite a while is, is stealing bits from my old drawing books and sticking them into pictures which would get, got stuck in a way. And this is from a, a botany drawing book in the middle, reversed here. And um, this, I was, well, this was about 10 years ago again now, and I, it, it ended up in the V&A Museum next, in a show called um, Digital Pioneers, because believe it or not, I quite undeservedly qualified as a pioneer, um, although there was many people who were doing it, all this a lot better and a lot before me. But it was very nice having a picture in the V&A for a while. See, these are some pages just from some how to draw books. This is from Walter Cranes of 1904. And the point about this is that it's very like the early drawing programs. You choose your size of brush and the qualities. Um, so there was this sort of um, connection. It's sort of very technical. And then you get some really absurd books like um, Other Vases, my favorite chapter, Other Vases in, dif other vases in Difficult Positions. Um, I've always found ellipses interesting to draw. And next one, please. And then you have um, one called Speed from the 1920s, and of course, and Speed would have meant a very different thing then than what it does now. So these are some paintings now which use sources vaguely related to that. This is from the lovely museum in Leiston in Suffolk, of uh, Steam Museum, it's called, and this is actually from a ransom lawnmower. Next one, please. And this is um, uh, quite a recent picture, quite large, about seven or eight feet across, um, which I call Life Study, but it's actually of an air conditioning unit from the 50s. This is about nothing at all. It's got a sort of tree in the middle. Now, finally, a couple of paintings showing you through the process. This is a, a painting that unusually started with acrylic for me. I almost always use oil, but this was, I, for fun, I used some purpley, purple and orange acrylic. I wanted to give myself a sort of problem. Oh, God, did I? Next, please. And it got, I think, um, like other painters, well, the way I work is to react against what's horrible in the picture you're doing and try and make it less horrible and failing. Next. And this is, again, I was making these um, models in paper and this is a digital printer, so to speak. And there was a shape there that rather interested me in the, on the left, a cutout shape. And this next piece, I, I integrated this into the... This became up, it's part of this picture up on the left here. These, the dots are all done one at a time, manually. Um, and it's a kind of vice I have. I just keep on doing it, I don't know why. And this picture wasn't going too well. Then I saw a fantastic exhibition of um, San Francis, his prints. And I thought, well, I'm going to steal that. I couldn't afford this print. It was really quite expensive, but I would have loved to own it. So I thought, well, I'll copy it. So I photographed it in detail. And I used the, what he'd done. Um, next slide, I sort of copied the idea into this painting. So you see this form, it's not exactly the same. I also love, I use, I use very good oil paints and I love the differences between um, some pigments. And this is the, the way the painting ended up with a, pen, with a marsh harrier there on the left. There's a pigment called, um, it, can you go back a second? Yes. It's called um, Italian umber green, which is kind of translucent. So that was very useful in this. So this, the, the, what I found interesting in this picture in the end was that, well, obviously I was using the Marsh Harrier, which I photographed at a great height with the zoom lens, because you could, the Marsh Harrier's circle like this really high up. And um, you, you learn to spot them out of the corner of your eye. You can't see them with the naked eye. You need a telescope or a zoom lens, really, at that height. But 
I, went, I, I was using it as a device. I was cheating. It was a device that might solve the problem of the picture. But what the result was that you didn't... I think when you look at it, you're not quite sure you could be looking at it from above, looking down, or you could looking, be looking up from beneath. Um, I don't want to go into, you know, whether it's um, a landscape or not, or it's a painting. Um, next, please. And this was um, at the summer exhibition this year, Sky, right, you see up there. But I was very pleased to get it in. I don't often get it. I go in for most years, and it was a, I haven't been in for a, about 12 years. Last time I was in the exhibition, I, my work was given someone else's name. But um, Now, next one, please. This is, a, again, an, an intermediary stage of a paper collage um, that's gone digital. It's both been cut about physically and digitally, you can see. And there's some motifs in this that are repeated deliberately. And um, next slide. This is a painting that was started out very um, pure and got sort of less pure. And so I used this sort of like a housey kind of form in here from that collage. I, I just put this in here. I thought it was wonderful for a while, and then I didn't. I thought it was awful. Um, next one. Now, this is a connection to Coventry. This last week I was um, at the Transport Museum, and I knew what I wanted to photograph. And I didn't photograph them very well, but it was um, bicycles. I took loads of pictures of bicycles. And what I did then, I, I used this next slide to um, as an over this is a digital version which I would often do of the picture in process and I had the idea of using the kind of bicycle wheel forms in to, to overpaint this picture but I used a different by um, I use a factor an early motorbike in the end um, that's the actual painting which um, has got uh, is probably complete now but it's a bit wet still And call it, I, have, I think of titles for, uh, for, without any sense of responsibility, but I was listening to, I'm a great Berlioz fan, and um, I was actually listening to um, Cellini, I don't know that, and so I, um, so I called this Let Me Be Cellini. You know, he was the sort of mad goldsmith. Thank you, that's all. Next one. 